Hello, and welcome back to Business Law Online. Uh, this week we're going to be covering uh, and studying the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution. Uh, with that in mind, I emailed the class a copy of the Constitution, or at least a link to a copy of the Constitution. I do think it would be helpful if you had a copy of it in front of you, uh, and, and this way you can refer to what I'm referring to uh, in my lecture, uh, rather than just relying upon me. Uh, so if you can, uh, before listening any further, uh, you know, pause this video and go get uh, the copy of the Constitution uh, that I sent you. I think it would be uh, uh, very important to have in front of you. And also you will get more out of this uh, lecture. As a matter of fact, I may have two lectures. I'll see because there is a lot of information. I'll see how far I get. All right, the Constitution. Well, well why study the Constitution? Uh, well, it's the governing document for the United States, and much of it, in fact, has to do with business. Make no mistake about it. Uh, that is one of the reasons why the Constitution was drafted. So, um, last Tuesday was Constitution Day. Um, I know probably most of you didn't know that, but um, it's a day to celebrate the Constitution. Um, and, um, you know, what was the Constitution? Well, you have to go back in history, and you have to kind of do a little bit of um, uh, of, of you know, putting your, yourself in, in the place of the drafters of the Constitution. Uh, the Constitutional Convention was held in 1787, but of course uh, we declared independence from Britain in 1776. Well, what happened? Uh, there are some historical facts that are important. Uh, in 1775, uh, the colonists from the 13 original colonies held the first Continental Congress. And at that Continental Congress in 1775, they decided they would try and uh, mend fences with King George of Britain. Uh, it didn't really work, so they met about a year later uh, in July of 1776, the Second Continental Congress. And the Second Continental Congress came out with two documents, uh, one of which was the Declaration of Independence written by a very young, barely 30-year-old lawyer named Thomas Jefferson. Uh, that, of course, that document is a rousing success. Uh, the second document to come out of the Second Continental Congress was the Articles of Confederation. That was the first governing document for the 13 colonies, if you will. Um, so what was the Articles of Confederation? Well, basically a complete failure. The Articles of Confederation set up a very, very weak and ineffectual central government. Basically, the 13 independent colonies were now acting like 13 independent states. The, the 13 independent colonies were not one nation. They were 13. Um, and the central government was too weak, too ineffective. Why? Well, the central government, for one thing, couldn't raise taxes. It had no way of generating revenue. It had to rely upon the states to pay taxes. The central government, uh, under the Articles of Confederation, um, uh, couldn't raise an army. And there were plenty of military threats all around, not just the British, but also the Spanish and the French and the Indian nations. Uh, they were all powerful military forces that threatened uh, each one. Um, in addition, the states themselves were almost at a state of war, some of them, over border disputes and the like. Uh, economically as well, the country was a basket case. Uh, the, the, the central government couldn't print money, couldn't coin money. Uh, each state had its own money. Uh, in terms of trade between the states, uh, states set up tariffs against one another. So militarily and economically, uh, the 13 countries were a basket case. And it was recognized that something had to be done. It wouldn't last much longer if they didn't. So they held the continent of the Congress. They held the Constitutional Convention uh, in Philadelphia in 1787. All right. Uh, what was accomplished at the Continental, at the, I'm sorry, the Constitutional Convention? Well, uh, they wanted to kind of get like a Goldilocks government. Uh, strong enough to respond to the economic and military threats uh, that uh, surrounded them, uh, but not too strong so as to trample uh, people's individual rights. So they tried to strike a balance. Uh, and how did they do that? 
Well, it's interesting, you know, when most people think of the Constitution, they think of the Bill of Rights. And that's great, you should. But actually, we, all, we will talk about the Bill of Rights. But um, uh, actually, uh, it was really the articles themselves within the Constitution. The Bill of Rights are really just amendments to the Constitution. Um, so I'm going to go over some constitutional provisions. So how is it they try to strike this balance? Well, uh, the first way they tried to strike this balance uh, was they set up what was known as a federal government. Now, before it was the Articles of Confederation. That means the individual states had most of the power. Uh, and they didn't want a central government that had most of the power. They set up a federal system of government where basically the central government, which is now known as the federal government, and the state governments would share power. That the powers of the federal government would be listed in the Constitution, and anything not listed in the Constitution would belong to the states. Um, that's referred to as a federal government structure. So it's power sharing between a national, central, federal government and a local state government. Uh, that was one way they tried to um, uh, strike a balance. Uh, another is they believe strongly in the separation of powers. And this is critical. Uh, the drafters of the Constitution were very well-read men. Uh, they had read Charles Montesquieu. They had read John Locke. And both of those philosophers, one French, the other Scottish, they identified two government functions. One, executive power. Executive power. Uh, was the power to enforce laws. And two, legislative power. That was the power to make laws. And both Montesquieu and Locke argued that when you have both of those powers in one government body, uh, that is the definition of tyranny. It will only lead to tyranny. And the drafters of the Constitution did not want tyranny. So what did they do? They separated out the powers. They had um, Congress, which consisted of two houses, as a matter of fact, the Senate and the House of Representatives, they would be the legislative body. And of course, there was the president. Article one of the Constitution, take a look at it, take a moment, sets up the Congress. Article two sets up the presidency. Take a look at it. Article one is really long. It's really long. Article two uh, is shorter. Uh, well, what about the courts? What about the Supreme Court? Well, the Supreme Court was set up by Article Three, And uh, the Supreme Court really is kind of a unique uh, American uh, uh, political contribution. Uh, we just don't have executive power and legislative power. We also have judicial power. And um, uh, as we learned, um, the courts in the United States are really equal to the other bodies of government. They're completely equal. Uh, uh, the United States courts are probably the strongest courts uh, arguably in the world uh, because they truly are co-equal to the executive and legislative branches. So we added that. So we added the judicial power. So they did it. One, they wanted to make sure they struck the right balance in terms of federalism, sharing power between uh, uh, the, the central government and state governments. The central government's powers would be listed in the Constitution. Anything not listed uh, belonged to the states. And two, they had separation of powers. They were going to have legislative branch, executive branch, and judicial branch. So they wanted to keep those government powers separate because they were afraid that if you combine those government powers, what would happen? Tyranny. So uh, that was how uh, the two main ways they did that, uh, uh, tried to strike that balance of a government that was strong enough to respond to threats, uh, but not too strong as to trample people's individual rights. All right, now, what about forming one nation out of really 13? Well, they also address that in the Constitution. Um, the first uh, 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 article, well, there are lots of articles that address it, but Article 4, uh, Section 1, it contains the full faith and credit clause. This is this is an important clause. Uh, what this does is it is it requires states uh, to recognize uh, legislative acts, in other words, laws passed by other states, public records from other states, and judicial decisions from other states. That is the full faith and credit clause. Um, um, 
So here, the attempt is, is even though each state has its own uh, legal system, its own state courts, still uh, decisions from other state courts would be recognized in those states. Um, it's, in a sense, it's kind of creating one uh, legal body, uh, but still each one is separate, the full faith and credit clause. So if you were to get a judgment in New York, if you were to sue somebody in New York, um, provided you went through the proper procedural hoops, that judgment, which is money, right? You're collecting, you're trying to collect money with that judgment, is enforceable in New Jersey. The New Jersey courts would have to recognize it, uh, provided that basic due process was followed. Uh, so that's very important. It's a way of creating one economy out of 13. Uh, two, uh, Article 2, Section 2. The Privileges and Immunities Clause. Very important clause. Uh, basically, what it does is prevent states from uh, um, uh, placing unreasonable restrictions on citizens and residents from other states. So, for instance, um, if I wanted to, I'm a resident of New York. I live in New York. If I wanted to buy um, a vacation home, in Vermont. Vermont cannot have a law on the books that says New Yorkers are prohibited from buying property in Vermont. They cannot do that. Um, again, though, there is a reasonableness. Uh, I'm an attorney admitted in New York. Uh, I passed the New York bar, uh, and I know New York law uh, better than most uh, uh, other areas of law. Uh, but Vermont, uh, they could require me to take their bar before practicing in their state. So there are some limitations to the Privileges and Immunities Clause, but basically it prevents states from imposing unreasonable restrictions on citizens of other states. Um, fourth, uh, and this is important, uh, I had mentioned before at the beginning of this lecture that economically the 13 states were a basket case. They had their own money, they had tariffs against each other. Everyone should know what a tariff is. A tariff is a tax on imports. They had their own tariffs against each other. Could you imagine that today? Could you imagine uh, making something in New York and when you cross over into the state line in New Jersey to sell it, you have to pay a tariff to New Jersey? But that's exactly what was happening. Uh, and this was a disaster back then. Uh, so what the drafters of the Constitution did was they said that only Congress can regulate commerce among the states, nations, and Indian tribes. That is Article 1, Section 8. Pause this video, take a look at it. Very important. It states specifically, Congress has the right to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. Um, Congress cannot regulate all trade, it's got to be something moving between the states internationally or with the Indian tribes, of which we now have many. Uh, that's also how the federal government gets its authority uh, over tribal lands. Um, it's the federal government that has a right to regulate tribal lands. Um, so what does this mean exactly? Because this is actually uh, the source of so much federal power. What does it mean, quote, among the several states? Well, originally it was interpreted to mean literally the transportation of goods or services, I suppose, across state lines. So think, for instance, today that would be things like trucking, railroads, uh, waterways, uh, airplanes, you know, literally uh, goods moving across state lines. Um, so uh, what about today? Well, today courts have taken a more expansive view of that. Um, for instance, and a lot of this came out of, of a litigation involving the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, much of which desegregated public accommodations. For instance, uh, a diner or a luncheonette. So what if you have a segregated diner? Um, uh, in a state that practiced segregation. Now, that diner owner may say, hey, I'm not engaged in commerce among the states. I don't have anything to do with it. Um, you know, I, I prepare my, my, my 
my burgers, my hot dogs, my French fries, my uh, my breakfasts. I, I prepare everything here. You know, um, I don't take any prepared food across the state. Well, the next question would be, well, you know, where'd you get your beef? Maybe the diner owner says, well, I got it from a local supplier. Well, where did that supplier get their beef? Um, you know, maybe locally, uh, but maybe it came from another state. You know, or if not beef, um, where'd you get your, your bread? Where'd you get the buns for your burgers? Well, I got it from a local supplier. Well, where did they get uh, the flour for that bread, the flour for those buns? Maybe out of state. But you could see um, it, it became much more expansive in terms of its interpretation. Um, I mean, today you can basically say that anything that could potentially affect interstate commerce can be regulated by, con uh, by the con Congress or the federal government. Um, so what if, for instance, I mean, this is an extreme example, I were to light a match. Uh, I would light a match in, in my home here in New York. Well, um, am I affecting interstate commerce in any way? On the face of it, most people would say no. But uh, where did the paper for the matchstick come from, if it's a paper matchstick? Chances are it probably came from Alabama. Uh, that's a state that mills a lot of paper. Uh, what about the match head itself, the, the, the magnesium and sulfur? Where did that come from? Probably not New York. It probably came from West Virginia or Western Pennsylvania. So arguably, arguably, I am affecting interstate commerce. Uh, but I just use those as to show you that arguably uh, how broad the power of the federal government can be to regulate commerce. And this is important for business people everywhere to know. You've got to know that. All right. Uh, and, but the idea, though, again, of putting Congress in charge of com commerce between the nations, among the states, and with the Indian tribes, is that they wanted to form one economy. Very important among the 13 original colonies. They wanted one economy. All right. Um, so that's the Constitution itself. Very important. Uh, now, what about uh, the Bill of Rights? Well, the Constitution, as I mentioned before, was passed in 1787. Uh, the Bill of Rights uh, was not adopted. They were not adopted until 1791, nine years after the fact. And the Bill of Rights are basically um, uh, uh, amendments. They're just really, oh, they are amendments. They are amendments. So they are the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. Now, um, the First Amendment states what? What does the First Amendment state specifically? That Congress shall make no law regulating, um, do they speak about speech first or the press? No, actually, the first thing they mention is religion. The first two clauses in the Constitution deal with religion. Specifically, uh, that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Why did they address religion first? Why did the drafters of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, think that religion should go first. Now, I, I personally don't believe that lists are accidents. I think that inherently, when people make lists, what do they do? They put the most important thing first and then follow in descending order. Um, it might be, it might be uh, that the drafters of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, uh, they were very aware of, of, of the history of Europe and all the sectarian violence. And what's the thing about sectarian violence uh, different from other types of violence. When people kill for religion, uh, those types of wars tend to be very bloody, very nasty. And uh, this country uh, has always been religiously very diverse. Even then, it was religiously extremely diverse. And I think probably what they wanted to do was to avoid the fate of many European countries uh, that, that had ended up divided in, in civil conflicts surrounding religion. 
uh, uh, mostly Catholic and Protestantism. So I think that's probably what they had in mind. So what does that mean? Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Well, um, if he wanted to, could the governor of New York uh, make Catholicism the official religion of New York? No, clearly no. Clearly the governor of New York could not make Catholicism, the official religion of New York, is prohibited by what's known as the Establishment Clause. All right, uh, but what about where it appears not so much that the government is establishing an official state religion, but the government seems to be taking a side in a religious dispute, perhaps. So, for instance, um, what about in New York? In New York, we had a law uh, defining what is kosher. Kosher in New York meant food and products prepared in the Orthodox tradition. What is New York State doing? Is New York State establishing Orthodox Judaism as the official state religion? No, clearly they're not. But what does New York State seem to be doing with this case? Uh, with this law. They're really taking a side, aren't they? And this was a real case. Uh, uh, this, uh, this involved a kosher butcher in Comac, uh, right here on Long Island, Comac, Long Island. And this butcher had um, uh, prepared meat in a kosher tradition, but the conservative kosher tradition, not the orthodox con conservative, uh, not the orthodox kosher tradition, the conservative kosher tradition. They had been doing so for 20, 25 years, never with any complaints or anything else. Well, one day he got a visit from New York State Department of Agriculture agents, and they find him. They said that you are not preparing food kosher. You're not preparing kosher food in compliance with New York State law. And he said, what are you talking about, New York State law? I'm preparing it in the conservative Jewish tradition. No. Kosher in New York means Orthodox Jewish tradition. So if you were that butcher, what would you think? New York State is taking a side against you and your religion. So that butcher challenged the law and, and eventually won. Eventually won. How did the butcher win? Well, the court looked at it, and the Supreme Court, 30 years, 25 years earlier or so, had actually come out with a decision addressing situations like this, where the state is not in adopting an official religion, but seems to be endorsing a particular kind of um, uh, a religious stance. And the name of the case was Lemon versus Kurtzman, decided in 1971. And in that case, in these types of situations, the Supreme Court set out a three-prong test to look at. Does the law violate the Establishment Clause? Number one, the statute must have a secular purpose. It's got to have a secular purpose. Well, in this case, maybe arguably... Um, one of the issues surrounding the adoption of kosher uh, 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 laws under the Orthodox tradition was that there was some issue of fraud, that foods and products that were more kosher really weren't. And that's a secular tradition. Uh, or that's a secular purpose, combating fraud. Still, still a lot of religion, though, isn't it? So the Supreme Court seems to be saying a little bit of religion is okay as long as the law has a secular purpose. Well... Arguably, the law did. Uh, second, the law's principal or primary effect must be one that neither advances nor inhibits a religion. Well, what about that? Here, it's not even close. Um, New York State is advancing Orthodox Judaism over conservative Judaism and certainly over Reform Judaism. And if you were, uh, if you were kosher and followed the conservative tradition or the... Uh, 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 reform tradition, you would certainly feel as if your religion, your, your religious beliefs are being inhibited, wouldn't you? I mean, New York State is saying, no, you're not kosher. No. So here, the statute, uh, the New York statute, 
uh, clearly uh, uh, failed. The third prong of the test, very important, is the statute must not foster excessive government entanglement with religion. A little bit of government entanglement is okay, but excessive government entanglement is too much. And here, I don't even think the court addressed this in, in their decision, but where are New York State Department of Agriculture agents going to learn uh, what's uh, uh, orthodox uh, kosher? Probably a pretty good source would be orthodox rabbis. Um, the court didn't even address this, but I thought it was you know, kind of obvious. Uh, I guess because they, they shot down this law based on the second prong of the test, that they didn't feel it was needed to go to the third prong of the test. But here, where, where, where are New York State agents going to get their information? Probably Orthodox rabbis are a good source of it. And that, that's pretty uh, 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 excessive. All right. Um, establishment clause, of course, so does not mean complete separation. Um, and to some extent, it does require a government to uh, accommodate religion, uh, specifically in public places. Uh, again, as long as that line is not crossed, as long as there's no issue of endorsement of a religion or a religious belief. All right. Uh, the second religious clause, uh, Congress shall make uh, no law, dot, 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 prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Prohibiting the free exercise of religion. <coughs> well, what does that mean? Um, think about, for instance, people who follow um, uh, a Rastafarian religion. Uh, part of the Rastafarian religion, uh, for some, means uh, uh, ingesting drugs, smoking marijuana. Uh, smoking marijuana uh, in New York, uh, may have, in certain quantities, possession of, of marijuana may have been decriminalized, but it doesn't mean it's legal. Decriminalized and legal are two different things. Decriminalized just means if you're caught with a certain amount of marijuana, you get a violation, basically the equivalent of a parking ticket. It's not a crime. You gotta call the court, plead guilty, not guilty. If you're guilty, you pay your fine. There's no jail time. There's no criminal record. But still, it's a violation. Um, so what about um, uh, people from the Rastafarian religious traditions? Can they say, hey, you can't prohibit me from smoking marijuana. I have a First Amendment right to do it as part of my religion. Well, the Supreme Court addressed that similar situation in two cases. And in both of them, they came out with different results, which is interesting. A lot of people think that the Supreme Court is immune to uh, public pressure. Uh, but uh, I think that in this case, they definitely were. The first case, Smith versus Employment Division. Uh, basically here, uh, there were two plaintiffs, uh, both of which were drug counselors, and both of which um, uh, were, were basically Native Americans. Um, they were drug counselors. Uh, I think it was either in the state of Washington or Oregon. They were doing a lot of work on Indian tribal lands where there's a lot of addiction, sadly. And uh, they lost their jobs. Why did they lose their jobs? Well, because they tested positive. They tested positive for drugs. They, and they're drug counselors. They tested positive for peyote. Now, this is interesting. Uh, and it, what happened was, they tested positive for peyote. They lost their jobs. They filed for unemployment benefits. Under Washington or Oregon law, you're entitled to unemployment benefits unless you were fired for cause, unless you were fired, for instance, for committing a crime. Well, ingesting peyote was a crime. So they were not entitled to unemployment benefits. But they said, hold on, this is our freedom of religion. You know, this shouldn't be a crime. So they made that argument. They made that uh, the free exercise argument. The Supreme Court heard the case. They heard the case. It went all the way up to the Supreme Court. Now, the interesting thing about peyote is um, it was illegal. I think the state was Washington. If I'm wrong, 
please forgive me, it was either Washington or Oricon. Uh, the interesting thing about the statue was uh, that it made it illegal uh, uh, you know, to possess, use, uh, the usual suspects of drugs. This is one of the arguments they made. Narcotics and barbiturates, both of which are what? Highly addictive and also uh, have a really violent drug trade associated with it. On that list, of course, was peyote. Now, peyote um, is a hallucinogenic drug. Uh, but it's not addictive. And that was one of the arguments they made. This drug, basically their argument was, peyote should not be on this list of illegal drugs. Peyote uh, is not addictive. As a matter of fact, if you ingest it, your body would naturally regurgitate it because it's very bitter. You actually have to make an effort to hold it down. So it's not addictive like uh, narcotics or barbiturates. Second, the argument was made, was that um, there's no violent drug trade associated with the drug. It's found in the wild. If you know where to find it, you can find it. If you know what it looks like, you can get it. It's all over the place if you know where to look for it. Uh, what do you think the Supreme Court did? Pretty compelling argument, isn't it? The Supreme Court said sorry, but no. No. Now, this is an important theme in all constitutional law. The Supreme Court said the state had, quote, a compelling reason to include peyote on those list of drugs. Basically, the, the quote, war on drugs. That was a compelling reason. Sorry, plaintiffs, it's not enough. It's not enough. Now, this decision, this decision received a lot of criticism from a broad spectrum of, uh, of political thinkers, um, basically as an assault on religious liberties. Uh, there was a lot of criticism about this decision when it first came down. As a result, in 1994, uh, 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 or 95, um, President Clinton and the Congress, uh, the Republican Congress de, uh, de facto, came up with the Restoration of Religious Liberties Act. Uh, Clinton endorsed it, Congress passed it, he signed it, and the idea was to overturn this decision. Well, the Supreme Court also heard that case and, and overturned the Restoration of Religious Liberties Act. But that's not the end of the story. Uh, about 19 years or so after the Smith versus Employment Division case, um, the Supreme Court heard another case very similar to this. Now, this case, the name of this, uh, uh, the names involved are Portuguese, so if I butcher the names, please forgive me. The case was Gonzalez, that's not Portuguese, obviously, it's Spanish, versus O Centro Espirita Beneficiente Uneo do Vegetal. It's a church. It's a church. It was a church based in Texas. Now, here, uh, it's an interesting fact pattern. Uh, I, I believe it was the minister of that church was arrested for drugs, for importing drugs into the nation. Specifically, Hoska T, H O A C, I'm sorry, H O A S C A T. Now, this T is also an hallucinogenic, and the members of this church would make tea uh, from the leaves, they would drink it, and supposed to attain religious enlightenment. Uh, and this, this, this tea, was uh, uh, illegal to import into the United States. It was on the list of illegal drugs. Well, here the Supreme Court, they didn't follow Smith versus Employment Division. They kind of did a 180. As a matter of fact, they did do a 180, and they said, sorry, federal government, uh, you have not established a compelling reason to prohibit the, the importation of this tea. So they kind of, they, they really did reverse themselves. And I think that maybe in part, um, uh, it, it was due to the fact that, um, uh, you know, that there was a lot of, of, of public uh, uh, outrage surrounding uh, the Smith versus Employment Division case. So, the religious clauses, very important. So think, uh, what about, for instance, um, uh, you know, a, a Muslim woman who wants to wear uh, she doesn't just wear a headdress, she wears an entire burqa. Well, the headdress, 
covers a woman's hair and parts of her face, but you can still see her face. A burka, though, does what? Covers her entire face. What if she wants to um, um, uh, go get a driver's license? Well, to get a driver's license, you need to have a picture taken. A picture taken of what? Of your face. Yeah. Is that, uh, can the state require her to do that? Um, and actually, there was a case like that in Florida. Uh, and, and ultimately, uh, the courts ruled that, yeah, yeah, she's got to, if she wants a driver's license, she's got to take off uh, uh, her burqa. She's got to show her face. Why? Uh, the court in that case ruled the state, the, the case actually had occurred in Florida. The state of Florida had made a compelling argument. They had compelling reasons for this. One, uh, what is a driver's license? I mean, obviously it gives you the right to drive, but de facto it's a national ID. Uh, two, uh, it's what you present to police officers and other first responders when they arrive where? Perhaps the scene of an accident, perhaps the scene of a crime. They have to be able to do what? Identify you. Very important. Three, the state of Florida actually made an offer to a woman. Fine, you don't have to take off your burqa uh, in public and have your picture taken. We'll just, we'll take you to a back room. We'll have a female take, you can take, you'll be alone. There'll be a female photographer there. You can remove it and, and she'll take your picture. So they were actually, what, quite accommodating to her. And the, and the, court, the courts in Florida said, you know, that's enough. Um, that, that is a compelling reason. And uh, they decided against her. It's a very interesting case. It's a very interesting case. Now, um, now, what about freedom of speech? Freedom of speech, very important. Specifically, Congress shall make no law prohibiting, abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Does that mean Congress can make any law, uh, cannot make any law, limiting your freedom of speech? Well, again, just like with religion, there are compelling reasons uh, to limit religious freedom. Perhaps there are compelling reasons to limit speech. And, and basically, the Supreme Court, over time, has come up with three tiers of protection. Three tiers of protected speech. Uh, the first tier is fully protected, and that is political speech. If you engage in political debate, no matter how disgusting. Uh, an interesting case involved uh, the suburb of Skokie, Illinois. It's a suburb of Chicago. Uh, back in the 70s, there was a really high concentration of Holocaust survivors who, who lived in Skokie, Illinois. And, uh, of course, who wanted to march through Skokie but uh, the KKK and the Nazi sympathizers. Skokie, Illinois tried to prevent them. The case went all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, no, they have a right to do it. So just keep that in mind, no matter how offensive the political speech, it's protected. Now that's speech. So that's, that's virtually completely protected speech. The second tier of speech, just checking for my son, I saw him lurking about, that's fine. Uh, I want to make sure he's all right. The second tier of speech, this is speech uh, that um, generally cannot be prohibited by the government but the government can regulate it as to time, place, and veracity. What is veracity? Truthfulness. And that should kind of give you a hint of what type of speech fits in this second category. What do we want to be truthful? Advertisements. So in this second tier of speech, you have commercial speech. Uh, so for instance, um, the government cannot prohibit um, uh, cigarette companies from advertising, but they can prohibit it where? As in terms of place. Uh, so, for instance, you do not see any tobacco ads on television. Uh, time, place, and veracity. So, commercial speech, advertisement, uh, that is uh, uh, protected by the First Amendment but the government can regulate it as to time, place, and veracity. There was an interesting story uh, coming out of the BBC. A uh, study was done indicating, for instance, uh, that um, uh, there's something like five or ten times the amount of alcohol-related advertising uh, in, in, in soccer matches 
football matches in Britain. And of course, uh, uh, British football as does much of European football and football in South America. I mean, when I mean football, I mean, uh, you know, soccer. Uh, yeah, there, there are, there's been a history of hooliganism often, often related to alcohol. So, you know, could potentially, if that was in the United States, could the government limit uh, or even prohibit alcohol from being advertised at uh, sporting events? I don't know, maybe, maybe, if they wanted to. <coughs> the second type of speech that fits within this category is offensive speech, not obscene speech. We'll get to that next. Offensive speech. That speech, for instance, that um, uh, would include, for instance, Howard Stern. Okay, now, uh, Howard Stern likes, is known as a shock jock. Um, so uh, that would fit under that category. Uh, I would also argue, for instance, the non-radio-friendly versions of, 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 of certain pop songs, basically with uh, uh, profanity in it. Um, that would count as offensive. Um, so in, in that second tier category of limited protection, if you will, and that's a good idea, you call it limited protection. The government basically can't prohibit it but can regulate it as the time, place, and veracity. Uh, you have commercial speech and offensive speech. Now, the third level of speech is unprotected speech. Now, this speech has no constitutional protection whatsoever. And what you're going to find with this category is the speech is really, really clo closely associated with some kind of action. You're not looking to debate politics. You're not looking to sell uh, men's suits. You're not looking to shock and entertain. You, you really have, um, uh, 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 it, it, it's borderline, you're, you're looking for a reaction, a physical reaction. So, for instance, I once said, uh, you cannot yell fire in a crowded theater. Now, Alva Wendell Holmes, Supreme Court Justice, uh, the turn of the 20th century. Uh, why? Why can't you yell fire? And today, it's probably what? bomb. You can't yell bomb on a plane or, or, or air, airport terminal. Why not? Well, because you're going to cause a panic. You're going to cause a stampede. Your point is not to engage in debate. Your point is not to sell. Your point is to, to hurt people. So no, that's dangerous speech, not covered. Uh, second, uh, fighting words. Words that uh, a reasonable person would consider a threat. And as a result, um, uh, you know, it, you're looking to elicit a reaction. You're looking to get into a fight, mostly because the other person feels what? Threatened. Uh, so fighting words. Again, you could see it's, it's uh, not looking to debate or sell. It's looking to elicit a response. Uh, words that incite the violent or revolutionary overthrow of the government. So, for instance, can you threaten to kill the president? No. No, you cannot. Obviously, as a matter of fact, when Barack Obama was first uh, uh, elected president, uh, a man in Tennessee had uh, made a posting on his Facebook account uh, that he was uh, going to kill the president. Well, the Secret Service, who protects the president, uh, took it very seriously. Uh, so, no, you cannot uh, uh, threaten the violent overthrow of the government. Uh, third, or the fourth uh, area, uh, this is a little bit different, defamatory speech. Uh, and and uh, it's important here to, uh, it, what is defam well, first let's define defamatory speech. It's basically a misrepresentation about someone. It could be libel, which is uh, 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 written, or it could be slander, which is spoken. It's a, it's a misrepresentation about someone. Basically a lie, if you will, for lack of a better word. It's important, though, to keep a distinction between public versus private figures. Private figures like me. You, uh, you know, we have ordinary defamation. With public figures, though, that would include, for instance, the president. Well, what if I thought, you know, or, or a senator or a governor? Uh, what if I didn't like what they were doing and I expressed an opinion? Could they potentially sue me for defamation? Well, they could, but in addition, uh, they have to really prove I disregarded all facts. So, but basically, defamatory language is not protected. Last but not least, obscene speech.
Now, what is obscene speech? Obscene speech, um, well, a Supreme Court justice once stated that um, he knows what obscene speech is, he knows what pornography is, he just can't define it. But the Supreme Court tried to define it. So, what did they do? They addressed the issue in the case of Miller versus California, and they set out a three-prong test to determine whether or not something is obscene. Now, the first prong is the average person applying contemporary community standards finds that the work as a whole appeals to purient interest. What are purient interest? Lustful interest. What's the problem there? What, well, first off, what's the Supreme Court trying to say? That the average person applying contemporary community standards, they're trying to say it's a local thing. You know, hey, we're all, you know, all the people in New York, they're crazy. They accept all kinds of behavior. But it doesn't mean they have to accept it in Iowa. If Iowa doesn't like it, they don't have to have it. New York wants it, they can have it. You know, same thing, L.A. You know, if, 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 if you know, people out in L.A. are a lot more uh, tolerant, they want to, you know, permit these uh, uh, types of activities, and they can. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't mean that people in Idaho have to community standards. But but here's the problem. What really are community standards? I mean, think about New York City. The people literally from everywhere, every religion, every ethnic group. Um, you know, what are the community standards in New York City? Um, you know, is it the East Village or Chelsea? Or is it, um, say, Graves and Brooklyn, which has a very different population from Chelsea or the East Village. What are the community standards? Further along that same line, who is the average person? Average in what way? Height? Weight? Education? Income? In what way? Again, in a city like New York, we have people literally from everywhere. Who's average? You know, that's, a tough, that's a tough thing to find out who is the average person and who is, uh, what are the community standards? Very difficult, very difficult. Uh, and that was actually a big issue. Uh, when, uh, I just want to mention briefly um, uh, uh, Times Square, when, it, when Times Square was cleaned up. All right, so that's the first problem of the test. The second problem of the test is uh, that is a, it is a patently offensive depiction of a sexual act as defined by state law. So there's got to be an act involved. Uh, what about nudity? In and of itself, no, nudity is not. Uh, now, now, does it you know does it mean it cannot be regulated? No, because if you engage in that type of thing, what are you trying to do? You're probably trying to sell something. Uh, so, nudity in of, it, uh, in of itself is not. What about the innuendo of a sexual act? Is that enough? Think about the Dolce and Gabbana ads. Um, you know, uh, I'm talking about the ones uh, here in the United States. You know, the ones in Europe are a little bit different. Uh, but here in the United States, there's certainly a lot of innuendo, uh, but there's actually no act, uh, at least that I haven't seen. Uh, I haven't seen one yet. Um, so it's got to be a, a, a patently offensive depiction of a sexual act. Third, the work taken as a whole uh, lacks literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. In other words, it's, there's, there's, there's no redeeming social quality to it. It really is all about sex, and the sex is what? An act. So that's that's unprotected speech. Um, now, what about Times Square? Now, I know that most of you taking this class, or probably all of you, are probably very young to remember what Times Square was like. Well, at one point, Times Square was really um, the center of the sex industry in New York City. Uh, whether it be peep shows, sex shows, uh, 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 and, and the like, uh, and of course, uh, you know, other industries related to that, prostitution, etc. It really was the center of it in New York City. Uh, but Mayor Giuliani wanted to change that. He wanted to turn Times Square into a uh, tourist destination once again. So how is he going to do that? He can go after those businesses and claim that they were um, uh, claimed that they were engaged in obscene speech, but uh, he, he was an attorney, Mayor Giuliani. He was a U.S. District Attorney in Manhattan. 
And uh, he hired uh, his attorney for the city, the one that he appointed. The city has their own attorney at that time, Michael Hess. They knew that this test, this, this three-part Miller test, was uh, a, a difficult hurdle for them to cross. So um, what did they do? Well, they, they tried to argue, of course, that it was obscene, but what kind of speech was the sex industry in Times Square engaged in? Now, arguably, it was obscene. If they can get past this three-pronged test, very difficult. I mean, what would be the community standards of Times Square? What would the average person living in Times Square think? Probably not much. If they're living in Times Square, they're obviously pretty open to it. Uh, but that speech, that activity, certainly is what? Commercial speech, isn't it? The point of that speech, the sex speech, basically is what? To make money, right? To get customers. So they decided, you know what? We're going to regulate it as commercial speech. So, for instance, uh, if those establishments, 40% um, of their floor space had to be G or PG rated. Now, for those of you in retail, what happens if all of a sudden 40% of your full floor space isn't generating any sales? It's not a good thing. Second, second, that 40% had to be up front. So all of a sudden, the windows start to look what? The windows in those establishments start to look different. You're not having the triple X posters and movies up front. You now have uh, Gone with the Wind and Bambi up front. So you're changing the look of the neighborhood. You're changing the look of Times Square. Now what eventually happened is many of those, it was basically an attempt to squeeze, to choke off that industry. And at least as far as Times Square was concerned, it basically worked. Not that the industry still isn't there, but it basically worked. All right, so um, we covered freedom of speech and freedom of religion. Um, I'm gonna save, I'm, I'm see, I see that I'm already past 50 minutes. I want to save the 14th Amendment for a separate uh, um, uh, discussion. Because uh, I don't want to, I know I'm throwing a lot at you, okay? And I, and I don't want to do that. I want, I want you to just, you know, I want you to appreciate this. This is good stuff. Um, and, you know, it does apply to you. Um, I mean, I mentioned the Dolce and Gabbana ads, and there are other ads that arguably are what? You know, maybe pornographic, maybe, maybe, or maybe obscene. You know, you got to make that decision. You may be in a position at some point in your career is to make that decision. All right. Um, so that's the end of this lecture. The next lecture will be much shorter. I'm just going to discuss the 14th Amendment. Um, and uh, uh, please email me any questions. Thank you. Bye-bye.